Good morning. Welcome to the Saint, or welcome to our Sunday morning sermon. I'm Dean Anderson from the Saint Albert Church of Christ. We are going to start with a scripture reading. We're going to start in Acts chapter eight, and we're going to read verses thirty-four to forty. So that's Acts chapter eight, verses thirty-four to forty. The eunuch asked Philip, "Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else?" Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Well, welcome everyone to join us on our online sermon this morning. I just finished a course on entrepreneurship and new venture creation at the university last week. It was a spring course that I was taking as part of uh, my degree that I'm taking now. And one thing I thought was interesting in this course is that, that they said that those people who start new businesses, those people who are entrepreneurs, they have what they have coined as the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mindset. So they have uh, a way of thinking in their minds that uh, to some people it comes natural, to some people it's a very deliberate thing that they do, that uh, gives them the tendency to want to start new businesses. And one quality of the entrepreneurial mindset was that they're always looking for opportunities. They're always looking for those things out there that uh, bug us, that, you know, give us kind of some, I don't know, maybe pet peeves in society or things that you can see are better. They're making a concerted effort to look for those things that bug people, including themselves, and then they formulate ways to solve them. So it's the way that they think about this is what gives them that entrepreneurial mindset. So they make a concerted effort to do this. It's not just something that they see kind of, you know, randomly, whatever might just happen to come up. They actually focus on it and do it on purpose to make sure that they can find ways to solve these little problems that are around in society that bother people. So it's kind of interesting. And I made the parallel to Christianity, thinking and noticing that we also need to have a Christian mindset. We have to make a considered effort to look for opportunities to spread the word. The same way that the entrepreneur might find and look for opportunities to create something and have value in it, make a business and sell it to people and solve those little problems that might bother us in society, us as Christians should make a concerted effort to spread the gospel, to make the most out of every opportunity that we have to spread the gospel and preach the word in all circumstances. And we're going to see in, in Acts chapter 8 a situation where Philip did this in this situation. He had that Christian mindset, and he made a concerted effort to look for those ways where he could spread the gospel in his situation. Uh, in our past lessons, we've been going through the conversions in the book of Acts. We're seeing how the church first started in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is essentially a book of history, which records the church as it first started, right after Jesus ascended into heaven and took his place of power in heaven. The church is starting on the earth, and the book of Acts documents that entire time, and that's what we've been going through. We saw so far that the conversions that happened in the book of Acts, when people became Christians, we're in large numbers. In Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, or at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were converted, so a large group of people. The next chapter in Acts chapter 3, we saw in Solomon's colonnade, where 2,000 more were added to the Lord's church. So again, a large, a large group of people. And then in Acts chapter 8, earlier in this chapter, when Philip went through Samaria, multitudes, uh, they don't give an exact number, but they say multitudes. So again, a large group of people were converted and brought to Christ and added to the Lord's church. And in each case, the gospel message was basically the same. Christ is proclaimed. His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. That was the message that was the core message that is preached and the same thing that we should be preaching today. And there were always responses for faith, repentance, and baptism in those cases. Uh, that was always what was asked of the people from the speakers in those situations. And in this account, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip talks to the Ethiopian eunuch, we see the conversion of just one person. So instead of having these large groups in the previous accounts, now we have just one person. So he's a queen's treasurer, a eunuch from Ethiopia, and he's described as a very religious man who traveled a great distance to worship God. And this is the account that we're going to look at today. 
Uh, we're going to have the opportunity to confirm what we've seen in previous chapters and previous accounts. And we're also going to learn a few more points about biblical conversion and see some of the things that Philip took advantage of. Again, he had that Christian mindset where he took advantage of this opportunity. So let's go through this account in Acts chapter 8. Uh, we read part of it in the scripture reading. We're going to expand that a little bit. We're going to go through uh, this account and see how this thing went down, how it happened when Philip spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch. So if you go to Acts chapter 8 uh, and start in verse 26. So Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Now an angel from the Lord said to, the, said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road. It goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So what's happening in this passage? We're going to see what uh, is occurring in this account. An angel of the Lord tells Philip to go toward Gaza. He's being directed to this man. And on the way, he sees this man, the eunuch, sitting in his chariot. Uh, he's a eunuch of Ethiopia. He's in charge of the treasury of Queen Candace. Uh, the version that I just read said of the Kandake. Uh, different versions are going to have different translations of that word, and Candace is one of them. And he was returning home from having gone to worship in Jerusalem. So he went from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship, and now he's going back home. And he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, we have that in our Bibles as well, the book of Isaiah. And the Spirit told Philip to go to the chariot. Uh, I often think to myself, you know, chariots are horse-driven, uh, you know, uh, devices. And so, you know, Philip, I wonder how fast he was to catch up to this chariot. But anyway, he went to the chariot, and he went and talked to this unit. So if we continue on, Acts chapter 8 and verse 30. So Acts chapter 8 and verse 30. We're going to read down to verse 35. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up with him, or to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So, again, if we go through what happened in this account, uh, Philip hears eunuch, the eunuch reading Isaiah. And he asks him, do you understand what you're reading? You know, I hear you reading this passage. Are you making sense of it? You know what's going on. But the eunuch asks Philip to help him. He says, you know, I'm not really sure what's happening. Can you please explain this to me? So Philip sits with him, and he starts to use that as an opportunity to spread the gospel. Uh, the passage that's being read in here is Isaiah 53, verses 7 to 8. And it talks about someone uh, led as a sheep to the slaughter. It talks about someone whose life was taken from the earth. So the eunuch asks Isaiah, was he speaking of himself or someone else? And so beginning with that scripture was, was a prophetic scripture talking about the Messiah, talking about Christ. He, Philip seizes this opportunity to preach Jesus to him. So he uses that opportunity. He recognized it and he takes advantage of it and he spreads the gospel by speaking the gospel to him. So if we continue on, Acts 8, we'll read verses 36 to 39. So Acts 8, starting in verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So the eunuch expresses a desire to be baptized, after Philip spoke Christ to him. You know, the words that are said here, uh, Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So that's the definition of how Philip, or, or the words that are said when he, that's being expressed that Philip spoke the plan of salvation to the eunuch. So the eunuch expresses a desire to be baptized, and he sees some water on the way, and he wonders, what's going to stop me from being baptized? And he asks Philip this. 
Uh, if you notice in verse 37, there's usually a footnote there. In the version that I was reading that I just read, the passage, it actually skips over verse 37. Uh, it's in some manuscripts, but not all, and that's why it's taken out of the, the general text in most versions and put down as a footnote. But if we read that, read verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the eunuch confesses his faith in Jesus as the Son of God. This passage doesn't get into detail as to exactly what Philip told the eunuch and exactly how he tied that passage in Isaiah in to uh, telling him the good news about Jesus. But we can see the response of the eunuch. We can see that baptism must have been preached because the eunuch said, hey, here's some water here. What's going to prevent me from being baptized? And also that idea of, of having that faith and that belief in Jesus. The eunuch expresses that, and Philip you know, asks, if you believe this, then you can, we can be baptized. Nothing's going to stop you. So we have this confession of faith that Jesus is the Son of God. And as we read on, Philip baptizes the eunuch. They stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch go down into the water. It's very descriptive. Then Philip baptizes them, and then they come up out of the water. And when that happens, it's kind of interesting, the Spirit took Philip away. Again, it's not really described how that happens or what exactly was occurring at that time. But Philip was gone, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. He's happy that it happened. He knew what he, he received when he was baptized based on what Philip told him, and he went on his way rejoicing. So, again, if we get back to this idea of, of going through the book of Acts and seeing these large multitudes of people uh, coming to Christ and being added to the Lord's church, why does the book of Acts spend so much time and so many words and so much in this passage about the conversion of just one person? There must be some important lessons for us. There has to be a reason for the scripture to expand on this one account of the Ethiopian eunuch so much. So what can we observe? What can we learn? How can we apply some of this to us today? If we look at the idea of prospects of people ready to receive the gospel, if you're wondering who to spread the gospel to, this passage talks on that a little bit. Uh, if you go to Colossians chapter 4, keep your bookmark in Acts chapter 8. We're definitely coming back there. If you go to Colossians chapter 4, this is a good passage that is one of those ones that is often in the back of my mind in, in lots of different situations. Philip, in the account of the Ethiopian eunuch, made the most of his opportunities. Colossians 4 and verse 5 it says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most out of every opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. That's what Philip did. He saw the Ethiopian reading Isaiah, and he used that to preach the gospel. He saw that he had the Christian mindset, or Philip had that Christian mindset, to use the passage to preach the word, just the same way an entrepreneur might have that mindset to look for those opportunities, to actively seek them out. That's what Philip did. He had a Christian mindset to actively seek out those opportunities to spread the gospel. And he also saw an opportunity that's interesting. Uh, it's in an area that sometimes we as Christians might write off. We might say, oh, they're not going to be interested in hearing the gospel. And that's what we would consider religious people. I don't know if you want to put religious in quotes, but this idea that are people involved in Christianity, they know about God. Maybe they're uh, members of another church or a different denomination or a different group. Us as Christians sometimes write those people off. We think, okay, they're set in their ways. They know what they believe. They're not interested in hearing anything about what I have to say about, you know, what the Bible truly does say. But Philip recognized that religious people are often the most receptive to the gospel. We might think if somebody's a part of another group or a church, they're not interested in the truth of the gospel. Maybe they, we think or we assume that they're set in their ways. But Philip didn't do that. He made the most out of every opportunity. He saw that the eunuch was a very religious man, and we can see that as we read this account. He traveled a great distance to worship in Jerusalem, and he was reading the scriptures when Philip found him. And in Acts, at least we see in Acts, and we're going to continue as we go through the book, most examples of conversions involve very devout people. We have the 3,000 at Pentecost. They were people who traveled from all around to observe the Pentecost, this feast day. Uh, we're going to see the conversions of different people. We're going to see Paul, who's a Pharisee, somebody who is very devout to studying the Jewish religion. Cornelius, a devout Gentile who feared God, prayed always. We're going to see Lydia, who met every Sabbath to pray with others. These are all people who are religious people, and Philip recognized this eunuch was a religious man, and that's somebody who would, be, uh, would tend to be more receptive to the gospel. 
And we can see this, we can see a couple of points from this. Just because somebody is religious doesn't mean they're saved. I think that's another thing that we sometimes might assume is that, okay, if they're a religious person, again, maybe I'll put that in quotes, they're already saved. They're already following that plan of salvation. That's something that we should not be assuming. We should check. We should verify. We should ask them, bring up the conversation, make the most out of that opportunity. And religious people are often very receptive to the gospel. They already fear God. They already, already respect his authority. And as such, they just simply need to be shown the way of God more accurately. Uh, this is something that happened in Acts chapter 18. So if you zip back to the book of Acts and go to 18, chapter 18, verse 26. So Acts 18 and verse 26. This is Paul speaking, and he's speaking very boldly in a synagogue. So Acts 18, verse 26. So he, this is Paul, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home, and he explained to him the way of God more adequately. Priscilla and Aquila had a religious mind. They were, uh, they understood who God was. They understood that he had authority. They recognized it. They respected it. They just needed to be spoken and shown the way of God more adequately. And that's something that we can do as Christians as well. When we make the most out of every opportunity, uh, don't just write people off. And again, I'm applying this to people who would be considered religious. Don't write them off. Don't write off anybody. Uh, take the most or make the most of that opportunity to spread the gospel to them, just like Philip did. He didn't assume. He didn't jump to conclusions thinking that this eunuch wouldn't be interested in what he had to say. He made the most of that opportunity, and he spread the gospel to him. This account actually teaches us three important lessons about baptism that we're going to see. Go back to Acts chapter 8. So three important lessons. You go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 36, and we look at the eunuch's question, what he asked Philip. So Acts 8 and verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in my way of being baptized? So what can this passage show us? Again, it can show us three things. Uh, this and more, actually. First thing that it shows us is the importance of baptism. The eunuch asked. Uh, one version says, what hinders me from being baptized? You know, what can stand in the way of my being baptized? Depending on how the version, your version reads to word it. He recognized that this was important. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, go up at another verse. It says, Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. We can see that this was included in what Philip told him when he said he told him the good news about Jesus. He talked about baptism. Uh, it doesn't say that specifically in the passage. It just says he told him the good news about Jesus. But we know that included baptism because the eunuch noticed how important it was. He says, hey, here's some water here. What's stopping me from being baptized? You know, he, he saw that it was important. He saw that it was something that he needed to do. The second thing that we can see from this question is that we see the urgency of baptism. We see the importance and also the urgency. The eunuch wanted to be baptized right then. You know, Philip told him the good news about Jesus, and he wanted to be baptized. He saw it was important. He wanted to do it like right now. So he noticed that how important that was. Uh, keep your bookmark in Acts 8, but go to Acts chapter 22 and look at verse 16. This is the account of Paul. Uh, Paul was told that it was urgent and recognized that it was urgent. Uh, Ananias is talking to Paul in this passage, Acts 22 and verse 16. So Ananias says this to Paul. He says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Philip must have expressed, or at least expressed, how important baptism was so that, Philip rec or so that the eunuch recognized the urgency, the same way that Paul was shown the urgency by Ananias. This is something that, if you've made that decision, if you believe in God and you understand what's at stake and how important it is, you don't want to wait. You want to make sure that you get it done right away. And that's what we can see in this passage. That's what we can learn. Another third thing that we can read from this account we're going to go to verses 38 and 39 of Acts chapter 8. So go back to Acts chapter 8. We are going to see the third thing that we're going to see. We see the importance. We see the urgency. And then we're going to see that baptism involves physical water. It involves water. This is a very good passage and account to show that it's not a figurative thing. It's not a sprinkling. It's not a pouring. It's an immersion in water. 
So we're going to read portions from Acts chapter 38 and 39. So Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they come, came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. So when the eunuch was baptized, the eunuch saw water. He saw it with his eyes. He said, hey, water's right here. Then Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water. He baptized him, and then they came back up out of the water. We can see in this account that baptism involves immersion in physical water. It's something that's very clearly shown in this account. Baptism means to immerse. It requires the baptizer to immerse the person who is going to be baptized. And that includes, at times, at least in this case, when they see water, they see, I'm not sure if it was a lake or a river or a pond or whatever it was in their case, but they saw a pool of water of some kind, something with some depth. They both had to get into the water and get baptized. And this is something that does occur and is clearly shown in this passage. Uh, if you go to Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, this is a really good passage to show that how Paul describes baptism as a burial. And it very closely mimics the act of us being immersed in the water, being dipped down into the water and then coming back out again. Uh, it's uh, something that really represents and shows how we are... Uh, you know, essentially burying our old life and coming out a new person. So Romans 6, we'll read verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Buried with him through baptism, raised to live a new life. That's that act of immersion and coming out and being coming out of the water and being raised a new life. Through baptism, we're putting that old life behind us and we're starting a new life as a Christian. Doesn't mean all of our struggles are over. They've actually just began in a lot of senses. We are starting that new life, that new life to live a righteous life, to mimic Christ, to be more like Christ. And baptism is that point when we receive that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Philip recognized that opportunity to preach the gospel to him and the eunuch recognized the importance, the urgency, and he recognized that it had to be that immersion in water. These are things that are shown in this one account of this one person being uh, added to the Lord's church through Philip's uh, giving him the gospel, preaching the gospel to him. So with this conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, we're really impressed with the simplicity of salvation. It's a simple presentation of the gospel. Philip preached the good news about Jesus to him. And we can see with this simple presentation Somebody can be saved and converted after just one lesson. It doesn't have to be a lifetime thing. There's nothing against that by any means. But it is possible for somebody to be saved by just one lesson, to recognize the importance, urgency, and that they need to be baptized. So whether it's preached to large crowds or just one person, the gospel is God's power to save all people. And our role is the same as Philip. We have to have that mindset of a Christian looking for those opportunities. Look to make the most out of every opportunity that's presented to us. And we have to preach the gospel to all people, even people that we might think is religious. We might think that they've had their minds made up. We can still preach the gospel to them. We can still have those conversations with them to show them what the scriptures are truly saying. And when the gospel of Jesus is preached, the death of Jesus for our sins is going to be stressed. We're going to see his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his coming again one day. And the importance of baptism, as commanded by Jesus, should be mentioned as well, must be mentioned as well, in fact. They will understand the peer people that we are spreading the gospel to. They should understand the importance and the urgency of baptism. And they have to understand that baptism is, involves that immersion in water. I'd like to offer an invitation. If you have not yet accepted Jesus on as your Lord, we can show you in the scriptures how to do that. Maybe you want to be like the Ethiopian eunuch and you recognize the importance and the urgency. And you want to be immersed for the salvation, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so you can receive the gift of God. We can show you how to do that, and we can help you with that. And if you are a Christian who has any needs, uh, please make your needs known, and we will help in any way that we can. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your word, for giving us uh, the scriptures uh, that we can study, that we have the ability to look in your scriptures and really understand uh, the plan of salvation, the gospel about Jesus. Uh, how we can accept this gift of salvation that you've offered to everybody. I pray that we can do that, that we can recognize the importance and the urgency of this, uh, that we can recognize that people do need to hear the gospel, and I pray that we as Christians can
preach the gospel to people and those people who have not yet been added to your church that they can accept this gift of salvation that you've offered to everybody. And I'd like to thank you for your giving us your son and for giving us your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be safe, be well, and God bless.